Okay, Mr. Gerber here. So in the last video for AP World, we covered kind of the beginnings of Hinduism and as well as the caste system and the societal impacts that that has on Hindu society, both, you know, historically and presently. So in this video, what we're going to look at is the impacts of Hinduism on in, or in, sorry, in India, uh, more long term, just beyond the social aspects of the caste system, and also look at agricultural impacts in India and kind of how that uh, also spreads out and affects Indian society. And then we're also look at the arrival and impacts of Islam in India. So you kind of see the essential questions here. So there are three of them that we're going to look at today. So describing the importance of Hinduism on Indian society beyond the caste system. Also looking at the, how agriculture shaped Indian society and trade. And then describing how, the ways Islam came to India and evaluating the factors that allowed it to spread to the varying degrees that it does within India. Because in the long term, what we know to be India today was different historically in the fact that Pakistan and Bangladesh were both part of India, but that also kind of uh, attributes to more historical processes, but also they split off in reality, or not in reality, but they split off due to a large part because of religious differences between Hinduism and Islam, Islam being primarily located in the areas today of Pakistan and Bangladesh, while still having obviously very large populations within India, I think it's like... It's several millions of people, I believe tens of millions, I don't remember the exact number, but it is a very large percentage of the population still within India, and then you have pockets of Hinduism within both Pakistan and Bangladesh. So those are the things we're going to kind of look at today. So importance of Hindu temples. So we only focused on the caste system and the uh, societal impacts and social status that uh, Hinduism has. So looking beyond that is the part of Hindu temples. So I know my face is probably covering uh, the record. Reporting here, so we are just going to go. Um, we can. I'm going to try and go. Yep, full screen to hopefully just that. So anyway, um, importance of the temples, the public life, economy, agriculture, education, and everything else all revolves. I don't remember what the and was for, but all of this revolves around the temples. They become kind of the pillar of society. Money in many ways, similar to the way that. The mosque was kind of the center of culture for Islamic societies and communities, the way synagogue was for Judaism and churches for Christianity for literally hundreds of years for all the religions. All right, it's only more recent times when the church or other religious places do not become the center of life for communities. So all this stuff gets based out of the Hindu temples, obviously the one down here in the bottom right being an example. So what goes on? Uh, so within the Hindu temples, you, under, you see that they coordinate uh, irrigation projects. Um, there's uh, things related to food su surplus, so any food that kind of uh, gets brought in or created in the community and there's enough to go around. Um, and then some, they can kind of hold back that um, for years in case they need to due to um, you know droughts and famine so that there is a surplus of food for the local community at least for a time. All right. Um, they oftentimes employ a lot of people to work the temple, the temple's agricultural land, and then um, you know give out that land for people to work, kind of a serfdom kind of thing, or indentured servitude a little bit, um, or if you want to think sharecropping in the United States um, by you know taking some stuff away from the people working the land as kind of like, hey, you get to live here, all right, but you got to give us some of the crops or some food or you know money in exchange for working and living on the land, all right. But also, uh, the temples would offer loans and investments to banks. Now, there's that little uh, um, conflict of interest there between religion and the economy, but um, it does tie with economic leadership and political leaders as well. So the church really does control or at least has a role in all these different facets of Hindu or uh, Indian life within throughout much of the Indian subcontinent. All right, education obviously also comes there, not only uh, public or not uh, religious education, but also just regular um, public school for um, the wealthier children, primarily boys, uh, to get education in things like math and reading, so on and so forth. All right. So I, I kind of already mentioned this to uh, you know similarities to churches in Europe, but also thinking about other religions and how uh, just temples and places of worship offer so many different services and provide so many things to different peoples. So keep that in mind because again, there is that kind of connection in time. So don't just think, oh no, you know, Hindu temples are doing all these things. Well, you know, a lot of other places of worship also indulged in these various things too. Um, probably not as much today, but um, especially in terms of the whole jobs thing and land ownership. But there are a lot of strong connections we'll see throughout history as we go throughout the course, um, connecting to other things that we've kind of mentioned here. Okay, so agricultural impacts within India. 
All right, so India is dependent on monsoon winds, right? Monsoon rains, okay? So, you know, a monsoon is just, you know, several weeks, if not months, during a certain time of year where it's just raining consistently um, day in and day out, week in and week in and week out, month in and month out. And essentially that feeds the, the water systems within India and other parts of the globe um, for various times. And the other parts of the year are fairly dry. So about six months of the year, India has to, you know, uh, deal with heavy rains. The other half is very, very dry. And so what they have to do is work with the summer months with the monsoons through the Ganges and the Indus rivers becoming very heavy. And then so do their subsidiary rivers and water systems. And then they bring most of the rain to the region and then depend on irrigation, mostly in the south, coming out of the Ganges and Indus rivers um, to provide water via dams, canals, think, you know, the Grand Canal in China, to again, bring enough water to support life and agricultural production throughout the rest of the subcontinent. So that, and once they kind of manage that and kind of expand those, um, you know, canals and waterways leads to, as we've seen in China, and as we said with the uh, characteristic civilization, more agricultural production, which then leads to bigger population growth, urban growth, trade, and that diversification. So this kind of all comes at the same time when we talk about the caste system happening as well. Unfortunately, in times when their monsoons are not very strong and there's not as much rainfall or too little rainfall, can lead to droughts and famine if there's not enough rain and not enough water to provide for agricultural product or agricultural production. And that in, in itself, you know, comes back to the point of the temples having that extra surplus food, All right? So we have that Hindu temple that we looked at. Um, so one of the things that we're going to briefly mention here in terms of uh, Indian numerals um, is something that is kind of taken away to kind of th use the idea of Arabic numerals. Well, the Arabs got it from the Indians, and this is the kind of numerals that we use. These are not the specific numbers that we use, but you can kind of see a two, three, you know, other kind of shapes in there, eight, um, very similar to what we use today for, you know, our numbers and understanding. So within that, now we're going to move to political division in India and the arrival of Islam. So by the time frame that we're looking at here in India around 1200, when we start, you know, the course and the grading and all that, India is politically divided. It's hard to kind of keep an area that large and that densely populated under one rule. And so, um, you know, for a long time, there is just no one group or one person in charge of the entire Indian subcontinent until, you know, about the year 1700. So about 1200 years or so, maybe a little longer, where India is divided between two, if not more, very large political groups. All right. So Indian struggle, Indian rulers struggle to unite the subcontinent, usually split between groups fighting for control. Um, for about a thousand years, twelve hundred years, like we said, um, southern India faces less violence and has mostly Hindu rulers, while northern India um, faces a lot of nomadic migrants and invasions, but is ruled by um, you know a mixture of Hindu, Buddhist, and later on Muslim leaders as Islam begins to penetrate into northern India, and that's where Islam is going to essentially take hold. It's not going to spread as much into the southern part of the continent, but it does um, make impacts there for the long term. So Islam arrives in, you know, a variety of ways. Here we're kind of listing three, you know, three and a half, four, if you really think about it. But, you know, kind of think about the ways in which this would be the most um, impactful and long term. All right. Because as we've said, Islam doesn't exactly, you know, grow at a very fast rate. The rule and expansion of Islam does, but the number of actual adherents slowly uh, gets captured over, or slowly grows over time. So the first one is the military conquest. So the northern area known as the Sindh region, and you can kind of look at the map on the, or in the textbook, um, remains mostly Hindu. There's again, not a whole lot of people converting to Islam, especially not right away. Um, so you have mostly Muslim rulers overall in charge and still have ties to the Abbasid and Umayyad empires and caliphates, but they do not force conversion. And so mostly for the most, or for the most part, um, they're relying on local Hindu princes, authorities, bureaucratic systems to run local affairs because you are in charge of all these people, but you're not going to force religion on them and you want them to be loyal and to provide you goods and services and you want to get tax money off of them and become wealthy, you cannot necessarily force the religion on them and you don't really know the local customs, so you rely on local rulers or more local chiefs and powerheads to kind of run the system for you. The second way is merchants. Muslim merchants dominate trade in the Arabian Sea going westward, so think coming out of uh, the uh, Arabian Sea, out of the Red Sea, and going into the Indian Ocean Basin. 
with merchants forming small communities in major cities along the coast. And that's something we talk about in the next minute when we talked about, when we will talk about the Indian Ocean trade. Many of them marry Indian women and become prominent businessmen and members of society due to the trade and are more likely to incorporate religion within Islam, within the Hindus, or within Indian society as well as within Hinduism. So the merchants play, again, that very large role and many people will are willing to convert in order to, again, get that status um, and those uh, benefits of being a Muslim merchant and all the products that come along with it. The other one is migration. Okay, so movement of Muslims looking for land and resources. So we talked about up here, um, you know, nomadic migrants and invasions. So coming out of like Afghanistan, coming out of Persia and Iran and even further west, we see a lot of Muslims looking for land and resources, but also people get, getting hired as mercenary soldiers coming in, living in India to fight for local chieftains, warlords, even the Muslim rulers in northern India and Hindu rulers in southern India, bringing their religion along with them for a fee again to fight their wars for them. So one thing to consider, and make sure you definitely look at this, because we're not going to talk about it in depth here, and this is where we're going to talk about um, this reading here, the uh, Sufis in Kashmir, again, is really essential to understanding more of this stuff in more complex ways with more specific information that you're going to find, um, especially the role of the Sufis. Uh, but also consider the Bhakti movement and uh, the factors that appeal within Islam to other people. Again, think about that relation to the caste system, but also the idea of syncretism will also kind of play in here. All right, so the overall result is that um, of this stuff, and, you know, again, you want to evaluate which of these, you know, factors within military conquest, migration, merchants, and the Sufi mystics as well, really are the, which, which ones really lead to a large growth of Islam over time. But anyway, the result is you have a slowly, number, a slowly increasing number of Muslims and the prestige of power in Islam grows as, through um, the influence in trade and food, architecture, and travel. Um, and unfortunately, in some cases, you do see the resulting destruction of Hindu and Buddhist sites when you get um, religious zealots coming out of Islam. But also you see that same reprisal against Muslims, too. Uh, but for the most part, the book mentions Mahmud of Ghazni coming out of Afghanistan um, because he believes that anything that is not Islam to be an affront um, and finds that very insulting and actually desecrates and destroys a number of Hindu and Buddhist temples. So that's kind of more of the long, you know, kind of a more outlying negative result, that doesn't mean the tensions did not occur. But for the most part, um, Muslims, Buddhists, and Hindus are able to live, for the most part, in harmony within India for a very, very long time. Now, it's, again, not perfect, and there are tensions and conflicts from time to time. But especially in those major cities where you see a lot of trading going on, it's a pretty peaceful, low, pretty peaceful place, or place says, because, again, they are in it to try and make as much money as possible, and conflict is not going to help with that. So that's where we're going to end it here. We're going to pick up with the um, trade in the Indian Ocean Basin and the next one, and that will also cover into Southeast Asia for Chapter 15.